Let's open up our Bibles together and turn to Acts chapter 17, if you would. This morning we'll be reading Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 15. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis, I'm going to get that out there eventually, get tongue-tied here. Let me start over. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, But Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we know, Lord, that it is a lamp to our feet and it is a light to our path. And we desperately need that light. We pray this morning that you would shine the light of your word into every single corner of our lives. Show us, Lord, who you are. Show us who we are. Show us your truth and how you have commanded us to live in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the last several years, I'm sure you've heard this discussion that's going on in our culture, which seems to be just going on and on over and over again about something called fake news. Uh, Fake news can be defined as stories that include deliberate misinformation or hoaxes that disguise themselves as real news stories. And these fake news stories have become especially prevalent on social media. In fact, If you're watching the headlines in the last couple of months, uh, some of the biggest social media companies like Facebook and Twitter have actually been considering whether they're just going to ban political ads all the way across the board because so many of the ads that go out contain false information. There's a ton of it. Last year, MIT did a study of stories on Twitter, and they studied some 126,000 stories on Twitter from three million users over the span of 10 years. They discovered, among other things, that falsehood spreads a lot easier than truth does. (laughs) They found that a false story reaches 1,500 people six times quicker than a true story does. They also found that falsehoods were 70% more likely to be retweeted on Twitter than true stories are. Can you believe that? A false story, just a blatantly false story, is 70% more likely to be retweeted than a true one. It's just one illustration of the fact that this is prolific, and it comes from every direction. It comes from both sides of the political aisle. It comes from all different persuasions and different ideas. All this false and fictional information is prolific, and it's had a number of negative consequences on our society. 
First of all, with an increase in fictional stories, especially on social media, there has been an increase in people believing things that just simply aren't true. You know, you know the old line, well, I've read it on the internet, it must be true, right? <laughs> No, the reality is, well, the likelihood that uh, it's true, being the fact that you got it on the internet, is probably pretty low. But with the increase in fictional stories, uh, people are more likely to be believing things that aren't true. Secondly, people are so used to hearing things that are fictional that even when the news is authentic and legitimate, they distrust it because there's so much false information out there that they just begin to distrust everything that they hear. And one of the saddest things I think that we're dealing with in our country right now is the way that now people just use fake news to discount anything they don't agree with. So it's sort of like, well, how do I determine whether it's real or it's fake? Well, if it, I don't agree with it, it must be fake. <laughs> but if I like it, then it must be real. Well, that's not a very good way to approach information, is it? I think we all know that deep down. But then thirdly, another negative consequence is that many people just don't know what to believe anymore. There's so much information out there, it's like, how do I know what is true and how do I know what is false? How do I know what is fact and how do I know what is fiction? And people are left scratching their heads and just saying, I don't know what to believe. Some people have just given up trying to be informed altogether, which I think is a huge mistake. But I say all this because we're very familiar with the fake news phenomenon. It's been talked about so much over the last several years. But there's something similar to the fake news phenomenon that I think is going on in Christianity. A parallel phenomenon in American Christianity to the fake news phenomenon, and that is that in the American church today, many Christians from many different denominations are confused about what they are to believe. Instead of calling this the fake news phenomenon, we might call it the, the fake teaching or the fake doctrine phenomenon. There are so many different ideas out there about who Jesus is or what is it that Christians are supposed to believe about Jesus or about God or about the Bible that many people are confused and they just don't know what to believe. This has been exacerbated by the fact that there are more and more churches and denominations that seem to be teaching new and novel ideas about the faith. And you've heard many of these, you know, some churches have begun to say, well, the Bible's really not God's infallible word that we can trust in a, as an objective standard, but it's a fallible book with many different errors, and we're free to reinterpret it according to our own standards. Jesus, you know, Jesus is not the only Savior. There are many different uh, paths to God, and there are many different ways to believe, and therefore, Jesus is just one among many. And there are churches that are saying that now. Some are saying that there are not unchanging moral standards when it comes to things like sex or marriage or gender, but these are all just social constructs that we can feel free to redefine according to our own modern values. And all these things, in many cases, are coming out of organizations sometimes, or even churches sometimes, that say they are Christian. And it's left many people wondering, well, what are we to believe? I hear so many different things. I hear so many different ideas. What is it that Christians should believe? How do I know what's true and what is false? And the answer to that, I'm going to just say to you this morning, is actually very, very simple. We need to get back to basics. Because the way in which we determine what is true teaching and what is false teaching is the Bible. God's word defines for us what is true and what is false, what is right and what is wrong, who God is and who we are, what we are to believe and how we are to live. It is the final arbiter of all truth. It is the one objective and unchanging standard by which all truth can be measured. Simple as that. I want you to listen to what the Westminster Confession of Faith says about this. It speaks to this reality, and it says, The Holy Spirit, speaking in the Bible, is the supreme judge of all religious controversies, all decisions of religious councils, all the opinions of ancient writers, all human teachings, and every private opinion. We are to be satisfied with the judgment of him who is and can be the only judge. There is one arbiter of all truth, whether it is truth that, whether, whether it is things that you hear on TV or in the newspaper or on social media or your own private conversations, there is one arbiter of all 
truth, and it's the one final authority on all truth, and that is Scripture itself. The passage that we read today from Acts chapter 17 gives us an illustration of the right way to approach Scripture and the wrong way to approach Scripture. There's a right way to approach the Bible, and there's a wrong way to approach the Bible. And in this passage, we see Paul and Silas and and their companions visiting two different cities. We see them go to Thessalonica, and we we see them go to Berea. And and what I'm going to say to you this morning is that the Jews in Thessalonica represent the wrong way to approach Scripture, and the Jews in Berea represent the right way to approach Scripture. And so I want you to see those two contrasting approaches, but then I also want to talk about, and we're going to talk a little bit about, what it means for us to use Scripture in our own lives, and what it means that the that scriptures are the arbiter of truth for us. So first, let's look at Paul and Silas in Thessalonica. The beginning of chapter 17 says that Paul and Silas come to Thessalonica, and the first thing that they do is they go to the Jewish synagogue. This was common practice. When they came to new cities, they often started with Jewish commu- the Jewish community. And they came there, and they preached the gospel there. Verse 2 says, Paul went in as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Now, did you notice that he did at least three different things with them? First of all, he reasoned with them. He believed that you could have a reasonable conversation about this stuff and that you could come to conclusions. Boy, we need more of that today. We need some reasonable conversations, don't we? (laughs) And he believed that Scripture was the starting point for having a reasonable discussion because that is the source and the foundation of truth. And so he reasons with them. But then he also explains to them. He explains to them from the Scriptures why it is that Jesus is the Messiah that they've been waiting for. He explains to them who Jesus is and why he had to die, why he had to rise again, and why it is that Jesus is the only way to salvation. But he doesn't just explain it, he also proves to them. Paul believed that the Bible didn't just suggest that Jesus is this Messiah. He believed Scripture definitively proves that Jesus is the one they had been waiting for and that he is the Savior of sinners. So he he reasons with them, he explains to them, he proves to them, he labors at this. It says that over three different Sabbaths he does this. He does it all from the basis of Scripture. And what was their reaction? Verse 4 tells us, some of the people were persuaded. And it says, many of the Greeks believed. Sounds pretty good. But the reaction of the Jews was quite different. Look at verse 5. It says, the Jews were jealous And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. Now, I'm going to just make a simple observation here. This is a great illustration of the wrong way to approach Scripture. (laughs) Because what happened here was that Paul had reasoned, he had explained, he had proved to them the truth about Jesus Christ, and they couldn't care less. It didn't even say they even gave it a second thought. They couldn't care less about anything Paul had to say. Why not? Because, the answer is simple, they had already made up their minds before he opened the book. They had already made up their minds about who Jesus was, And they had already made up their minds about what Scripture said, and so they weren't willing to listen at all. They came to Scripture having already come with their own conclusions about what was true and false about Jesus. And so they weren't willing to listen. And you know, there's a huge danger of people making the same mistake today. We have to be careful that we don't come to Scripture having already made up our minds about who God is, having already made up our minds about who, who Christ is, having already made up our minds about who we are, having already made up our minds about what is right behavior and wrong behavior, right beliefs and wrong beliefs. We don't come to Scripture with our minds already made up. Scripture tells us those things. When we allow our own values, our own assumptions, and our own standards to determine what Scripture says, guess what? We're not reading the Bible anymore. We're just listening to ourselves talk. You know, that's actually possible. You could open up your Bible and read it and just be listening to yourself. 
if everything that you read is being shaped by what you've already determined to be true. And we're not opening this to listen to ourselves talk. We're opening it to listen to God talk. To put it another way, it's been said that we should never stand above Scripture as a judge of what Scripture says. Scripture always stands above us and is the judge and the arbiter above us. God determines what is right and wrong, not us. God determines what is true and false, not us. The Jews in Thessalonica, hey, they had made up their minds before Paul even began talking. And they were closed off to what he was going to say. And really, if you want to get right down to it, what they had done is they had made themselves the arbiters of truth instead of looking to Scripture as being the arbiter of truth. It's the complete opposite way we should approach Scripture, and we need to be careful we don't fall into that same trap. But what about Berea? After this mob drags the believers out before the authorities in Thessalonica, eventually they let them go, and then Paul and Silas move on to Berea. And just like in Thessalonica, uh, they go to the synagogue in Berea. The first thing that they do is they go to the synagogue and they preach the gospel. But there's a really deliberate contrast in these two passages between the two reactions of the two Jewish communities. The Jews in Berea react quite differently. Verse 11 says, Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica, they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. Now, I want you to see the contrast here. You see how, how stark a contrast the reaction is between these two groups? In Thessalonica, they respond to the word with jealousy, in Berea, they respond with eagerness. You know, first case is sort of like, don't even talk to me about that. I don't want to hear about it. Second case, it's give me more. I want to hear more about this. Tell me more. I'm eager to learn. And, and then you know, another contrast is that in, in Thessalonica, they just ignore the scriptures, whereas in Berea, they pay attention to the scriptures. In other words, the Bereans illustrate for us the right way to approach scripture. We don't come to scripture having made up our minds. Notice both of these two groups were Jewish communities. In other words, neither one of them would have at first believed Jesus as the Messiah. But in one case, they were totally not even open to the idea and just wrote it off before they even looked at the word. In the second case, they were willing to consider and look at the scriptures and say, let's look and say, see if scripture really says that what Paul is teaching is true. They were open to considering it. And the way that they determined whether it was true was by looking at the word. In other words, they didn't assume they were arbiters of truth. They assumed scripture was the arbiter of truth. And they wanted to submit to whatever God's word taught. Now hear me when I say this to you this morning. We need, in the American church today, we need a lot more Bereans and a lot fewer Thessalonians. <laughs> We need a lot more Bereans and we need a lot fewer of these particular type of Thessalonians. People who are willing to come to Scripture and submit to Scripture. When I look at the church in the United States, I, I don't think I'm going out on a limb here. There's a lot of doctrinal confusion. And there's a lot of us imposing upon Scripture our own standards, our own beliefs and coming with the conclusions that we have drawn before asking, what does God actually have to say? And we need to be more like the Bereans. So I want to spend the last few minutes here talking about what were the characteristics of the Bereans. And I want to highlight three characteristics for you of the Bereans that I think should be true of every single Christian today, every single one of us. So what were these characteristics? First of all, the Bereans were eager learners. They were eager learners. Verse 11 tells us that when Paul preached the gospel to them, they received the word with eagerness. They were eager to learn more about Scripture. Um, when I think of the Bereans, I think of these words from Psalm 119. It says, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Those words could have been written by the Bereans. 
You know, we, we delight in the Word. We want to learn more of the Word. We want to, we want to learn from the Word. That, is, that was the attitude. Um, they knew that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And they needed spiritual nourishment. They wanted to learn from Scripture. All Christians should be eager to learn more about God's Word. All Christians should be eager to read the Bible. Um, and I think many people struggle with this today, and understandably so. There are many Christians um, who struggle with being eager to read the Bible because for many Christians it seems inaccessible. It seems hard to, to, to understand, and where do I start, and how do I read through it, and what about some of these books of the Bible that are really um, difficult to understand and interpret? And so I sympathize with that. Um, let me get real practical here and make one practical suggestion to you. If you're somebody who struggles to uh, kind of understand some of the Bible and uh, struggles with feeling it like it's not accessible, the number one tool I would suggest every Christian have is a good study Bible. You know, study Bible, I, I've come to the conclusion more and more every year that goes by, is, is the most indispensable tool for a Christian who um, needs help in, in, in working through the Word. Because what a study Bible is, for those of you who might not know, is it's just simply, uh, it's a Bible with the full text of the Scriptures, but that has uh, notes and explanations at the bottom of each page, helping you to understand what you're reading and work through it. And if you don't have one, then I would suggest you get one, because it's really helpful in working your way through the Bible. Um, if you're looking for a recommendation, there are two study Bibles that I think are far and away the best study Bibles out there. There's lots of good ones, so these aren't the only good ones, but I think they're the best two. And they are the ESV Study Bible and the Reformation Study Bible. If you're looking for a study Bible, those are the two I would recommend most highly. The ESV Study Bible and the Re Reformation Study Bible. Uh, those will help you to be an eager learner, like the Bereans. Secondly, the Bereans were daily readers. Daily readers. Verse 11 says they examined the scriptures daily. In other words, it's, very, it's made very clear that they were not just looking at the Bible occasionally or once a month or even once a week. They were looking at it every single day, and we need to do the same thing. You know, the only way you're really going to grow in your knowledge of scripture is if you're in it on a continual basis. I think of Jesus' words in John 8, 31. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Well, what does it mean to abide? Abide means to remain in something continually. Not just occasionally, but abiding is a, it's an idea of being continually in something. So Jesus says, if you're continually in my word, then you are my disciples, and you will know the truth. That's how you'll know the truth. If you are remaining in it, we need to be in the scriptures on a daily basis. I think of the words of Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. Boy, now we're really up in the ante. The Bereans were only reading it daily. They could have added nightly to it, right? <laughs> the point is we're, we're called to be in the word continually. And that's the only way that we're really going to have a familiarity and an understanding of what God teaches. You know, I think one of the reasons that many Christians get taken in by false teaching today is because they're, they're just not familiar with what the Bible teaches. If you're not familiar with the truth, then you won't be so familiar with what isn't in accord with the truth. And, and to say it differently, the more you're familiar with Scripture, the more quickly you will be able to recognize very quickly, ah, that teaching is not consistent with what scripture teaches. Be very quick to do that if you're a daily reader of God's word. And so we need to be daily readers like the Bereans. Let me give you another practical suggestion in this regard. Over the past several years, the thing that has kept me in the Bible daily is having a plan. You know, you might think, well, this is all very easy for Stephen. He's a pastor, so he just naturally loves reading Scripture. I mean, he goes home, and that's all he does. He just stares at the wall and reads the Bible. That's probably all he does. No. It doesn't come any easier for me as it probably does, it, any more easily than it does for you. I, these are things we all struggle with, and it's very hard to maintain in a disciplined way, staying in the Word every day. That doesn't come naturally to me uh, just any more than it would to anyone else. But the thing that's helped me 
is to use a, a Bible reading plan. You know, all it is is just a schedule of readings to help you work through Scripture on a daily basis. A lot of them are like a one-year plan where if you follow the readings, a couple chapters a day, you'll go through the whole Bible in a year. And I've done that for the past several years. It's only a little couple chapters every single day. Um, you can look these up online. There's a lot of different ones. If you get a good study Bible, oftentimes there's one in the back. Um, but it's helpful because you're not going to get anywhere if you don't have a plan. It's sort of like, you know, when people hit New Year's and they say, I'm going to get in shape this year, but they don't actually have any systematic plan and, and to do it. Usually that goes nowhere, right? Because you need something to, to help you along. I do believe we should be daily readers of God's Word, but I don't believe that happens automatically. And so I would, I would recommend that to you as one way you can be a daily reader in addition to being an eager learner. And let me add one more piece to this, and that is that the Bereans were diligent examiners. Diligent examiners. Verse 11 tells us, they examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us, first of all, they were examining the scriptures. But why were they examining the scriptures? To what end or to what purpose? They were doing it to determine whether the things that they were hearing from Paul were actually true. In other words, this reveals that they saw scripture as the arbiter of truth. It was the objective standard by which they could test everything that they heard and determine whether it's something that they should believe and accept. If they looked at Scripture and it wasn't in accord with God's Word, then they would dump it, because if it's not in accord with God's Word, then it shouldn't be believed. On the other hand, if they looked at Scripture and it was in accord with God's Word, they had no choice but to accept it, because this is God himself. Scripture for the Bereans was the measuring stick by which everything could be determined, what was true and what was false, when it came to doctrine, when it came to the Christian life. They took seriously passages like Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet, and it's a light to my path. It shows me the way that I should go. And we need this kind of discernment in the church today. We, we, we desperately need Christians who are diligent examiners. You know, one of the reasons why I think there is so much confusion in the American church today is not just because there's lots of false teachings floating around. In a sense, that's been true forever. I mean, if you read church history, every century you look at, there's, there's been wacky teachings that people have come up with. Where we get into trouble is, is not just when there's false teachings floating around, but when we don't stop to examine whether the things that we're hearing are actually consistent with God's word. That's when the trouble really starts. Not everything that looks Christian and that sounds Christian is really biblical. And this is where we get ourselves into trouble. You know, you can pick up a book or you can turn on the TV and hear somebody talking and they sound Christian and they might look Christian and the things they say might sound like they're biblical, but under closer examination, that's not always the case. And so what do we have to do? We have to examine the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. That's what the Bereans did. I want to close by saying this. I started this sermon by saying that there's a lot of talk in America today about how we have a fake news problem, and that's probably true. Um, but there's probably not enough talk about how in the American church we've got a fake teaching problem. We've got a lot of weird ideas floating around. We've got a lot of weird doctrines that are floating around. And as I said earlier, a lot of people are wondering how do they sort through that confusion? How do we determine what is true? The answer is the Bible. Some of you have heard me use this illustration before, but I like to talk about the Bible as a touchstone. A touchstone is, well, was in previous centuries, something that people would use to determine whether precious metals, particularly gold, was genuine. In the old days when people were trading, buying and selling gold and trading gold, one of the things that you had to protect yourself against was um, gold that wasn't genuine. 
You know, if you're going to be buying and selling gold, if you're going to be trading this, you want to make sure the gold that you're getting is genuine. And so they had a stone that was called a touchstone. And you could take gold that somebody had and you could rub it across this, this particular stone. And it would, if the gold was genuine, it would leave these gold streaks behind. If it was not genuine, it would not. And you could tell very quickly whether you were dealing with genuine gold or, or whether you were dealing with uh, fake gold, fool's gold. And I thought, what a perfect illustration for the way that Christians should approach the, the Bible. The Bible should be our touchstone. It should be that thing which we, we take everything that we, we hear, everything you hear on TV, everything that you hear uh, from, from a movie, from a book, from the news, from our culture, anything about, uh, about that you're hearing people say about God or about Jesus or about any of these doctrines, and you say, I'm going to run that through Scripture and see if these things are so. I'm going to run it across Scripture. I'm going to look and examine this according to God's Word because God's Word is going to be the final judge. It's going to be the final say about really what is true and what is not true. The Bible's our touchstone. So I encourage you to take everything and run it across Scripture. We need to be Bereans who examine the Scriptures daily to see if these things are so. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, that in the midst of a dark and confusing world, you have not left us in the dark, but you have given us a light, the light of your word, which is a lamp to our feet, and it is a light to our path. Lord, forgive us for the ways in which we don't always use Scripture as a lamp. Sometimes, Lord, we confess to you and ask your forgiveness this morning. We use our own understanding as a lamp. We use other cultural wisdom as our lamp. We, we sometimes use the wrong things as our lamp, Lord, and we ask your forgiveness for that this morning. Bring us back to your word. And we pray that you would help us to be like the Bereans. Help us to be eager learners, Lord, wanting more and more of your word each day. Lord, help us to be people who are diligent examiners and daily readers. Help us to be so saturated in your word that we know the truth and that we are committed to the truth and that we share the truth with all of those whom we come into contact with. Lord, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks for your grace in our lives. And we praise you, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.